use of the word persecution in verse 1. A great persecution broke out. I. Howard Marshall, in his commentary, observes, this is the first occurrence of the word persecution in Acts. As used here, it means harassing somebody in order to persuade or force him to give up his religion or simply to attack somebody for, Christ for religious reasons. The Christians maintained their faith and preserved their lives by flight to points where their persecutors could not be bothered to reach them. So this is not generic cruelty or even ethnic cruelty. This is specifically religious persecution. It is meant to force them to renounce Christ to deny the faith. Now let me just pause here and say, we are undergoing major disruptions in our society right now. And we are not able to meet as a church because the governor has said no more than 10 persons in a room. So we're abiding by that. But you know, this isn't specifically religious persecution we're undergoing. These restrictions are on businesses, on schools, on all sorts of different societies within our big society. And it's nothing specifically to do with our religious practice. Our governor did not say, you may not worship God. He did not say, churches are the one institution that have to stop meeting. Lots and lots of groups across the spectrum have stopped meeting. I suppose if there's an atheist group, they have to stop meeting. And so this is not specifically religious persecution that we are presently undergoing. It could become that, but as of right now, it is not that. Just to be uh, clear on that point. Now Derek Thomas and his commentary also looks at the gravity of this situation in Acts chapter 8, and he keys in on the word ravaging in verse 3. Saul was ravaging the church. Thomas writes, It must have been an extraordinary time in Jerusalem as homes were ransacked and men and women were dragged away to prison. The brief description that Luke gives should not cause us to minimize the pain and anguish felt by the Christian community. Luke employed a verb rendered ravaging to describe what Saul was doing to the church. It is a very strong word meaning a brutal and sadistic cruelty. The church found itself in enemy-occupied territory as Jesus had said at Caesarea Philippi, and Satan's stronghold was doing its level best to defeat her. This is very painful times for the church. As he was ravaging, people were suffering. He was brutal. He was sadistic. Now Paul himself gives further insight into this when he speaks of it in Acts 22. So again, turn to Acts 22, verse 19. And I said, Lord, they themselves understand that in one synagogue after another, I used to imprison and beat those who believed in you. And when the blood of your witness Stephen was being shed, I also was standing by approving and watching out for the coats of those who were slaying him. So Paul says, I used to imprison them and beat those who believed in you. He was involved in beating Christians. And then one more passage, Acts 26. He comes back to this again. Acts 26, looking at verse 9. So then, I thought to myself that I had to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And this is just what I did in Jerusalem. 
not only did I lock up many of the saints in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, but also when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. And as I punished them often in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme, and being furiously enraged at them, I kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. So here's Saul thinking he has to do hostile things against the Lord Jesus. And as he is going to the synagogues, he is trying to force people to blaspheme. He's furiously enraged at these Christians. So what kind of monster casts his vote against innocent people in order to put them to death? What sort of evil tyrant tries to force men and women to blaspheme and is so furiously enraged at them that he chases them to foreign cities in order to persecute them? This sounds like the Gestapo in Nazi Germany or the KGB in the Soviet Union. And yet that's exactly what he did. And that's why he was so very ashamed much later in his life when he tells the Corinthians, I am the least of the apostles and not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church. This is not false modesty on Paul's part where he's saying, oh, I'm just such a horrible person. No, he was ashamed throughout his life those wicked scenes of beating and murdering Christians just would come back to mind. And he would feel that deep regret, that sense of having been a horrible man. And yet he knew that the grace of God was sufficient for him, even such a wretched, vile sinner as he had been. It's no wonder that Paul several times calls himself the chief of sinners for what he had done. So as we gaze on this horrific scene, what were the effects of this persecution? Well, there are four of them that I can see. Perhaps there are more. The first effect is that a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem that day, and believers were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. So for the time being, the church in Jerusalem was devastated. It's true that the apostles remained there and were apparently unhindered, but the church as a body was broken up and scattered abroad. And whenever persecution falls upon the church, the church can be deeply impacted in these ways. Take a look at what has taken place in the church in China due to the persecution there. And again, there's even a sense in which we're feeling some of these same effects. Now, I said before, and I believe, this is not specifically religious persecution. But we're not able to meet together. And our assembling together is a very key component for our identity as a church and as believers. The Christian faith is not meant to be practiced alone that's why in the book of Hebrews it says, do not forsake the assembling together of yourselves, as is the habit of some. Now in our time, at this particular moment, we are told by our civil magistrate we should not meet together with a large group for danger of infecting others. And we certainly have sensitivity to that. We don't want our older members to be endangered by this deadly disease. But we feel the sense of being separated and not able to shake people's hands or give someone a hug. We have to be six feet apart, so they tell us, and, and we can't be in close physical proximity. And that hurts us. It should hurt us. You know, maybe we've taken this too much for granted. We've just thought, well... I'll go to church on Sunday if I feel like it. And then we're told you can't go to church on Sunday. And you say, wow, I really miss it. 
I miss being able to shake everyone's hand as they leave the sanctuary. I miss coffee time where we can talk together and share a, a snack. I, I miss our Sunday school time where we can pray together and watch a video or have a class together. Those are important times, and now they're taken away from us, hopefully very temporarily, and yet we feel it. The church in Acts felt that scattering apart. They were impacted. We're impacted as well. A second effect, the serious evangelization of Judea and Samaria is now commenced. In verse 4, we will read that those who had been scattered abroad went about, about preaching the word. They were unleashed to bring the gospel to these regions, which had been a part of the original commission, which Jesus gave when he was ready to ascend. You shall go and be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Well, God is using this persecution to drive his church out to Judea and Samaria so that they can evangelize. And they do it. They go out preaching the word to those whom they encounter as they flee from the persecution in Jerusalem. You know, times of difficulty are not always entirely bad. We tend to complain and say, oh, I just can't take it anymore. I went to the store and there was no milk and I haven't found toilet paper in weeks. And, and we, we bathe in our self-pity. But you know, God's doing something. Do you have a sense that God's doing something in our world right now? Our, our world, which has become so very secularized and so bold and audacious in its secularism, it's as if the whole human race has been shaking its fist at the Almighty, and the Almighty is saying, I won't take that from you. I am going to show you that I am still God, and you are mere men. And so in the midst of times of disruption, while the world around us is panicking in fear, the Christian is saying, how can I use this for kingdom purposes? How can I use this for spreading the good news? Who is someone in my areas of influence, my circles of connectivity, that I can bring the gospel to that needs the gospel at this moment? Even though we can't meet in large groups, we can still reach out to those around us with the good news of Christ. And so... With this persecution that scatters them out of Jerusalem, good things come. And this just proves what God says in Romans 8. He works all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purposes. Do you believe the coronavirus and this crisis and all of the economic implications of this are going to be used for good by God for his people? He will use it for good. Now, that good may take a very different form than what we would anticipate. We might not see it right now as good, but one day we will be able to look back and say, oh, it is so good that God did what he did in 2020. And so evangelization goes forward. A third effect is that it stirred up the godly courage of devout men in the Jerusalem church. And I say that because in spite of the obvious danger, those men took Stephen's dead body and they buried him, making loud lamentations over him. Now in that climate, they must have been taking extreme risks to do that. Everyone was against the Christians. The power of the Jewish authorities were against Stephen and all who stood with him. And yet these men trusted God and they loved their dear brother Stephen and they accepted 
Yea, they even embraced the risk of giving him a proper burial. Their public acts and their loud lamentations would be a standing testimony and protest against the evil of the Sanhedrin. This is courage. This is godly courage. Not foolheartedly braggadocio courage, the kind of courage that fools will sometimes manifest. This is godly courage. Be of good courage, people of God. You are the Lord's people, and he has promised that his spirit will fill you and empower you, and he will go with you. He will fight for you. He will save you. Be of good courage. Use your opportunities to the best of your ability. These times are full of disruption, and people who are perceptive understand that in a moment of crisis, there are ways to take advantage for good. Right now, the stock market is down, down, down. And I'm hearing various people say, if you've got the ability to do it, now's the time to buy, because when it comes back up, you're going to be sitting pretty. You see, those worldly people know that there's ways to take advantage of the situation for their own enrichment. And the, the sons of, of God are so often just naive and gullible, and they don't understand that in the midst of trial, you have opportunity. When people are afraid, they are more open to saying, what do I do? Where do I turn? And you have opportunities to say, you know, look to God, and he will help you. He will keep you. He will save you. And so these courageous men give us a strong example of how to act when times are difficult. Well, the last and final effect is surely the saddest of all. Christians in those days were injured, imprisoned, harassed, reviled, abused, and in some cases even put to death. Persecutions of this sort always have a human cost. It's the real suffering that comes into our experience through such events. And even now, this has some connection to our situation. Are, are Christians, as Christians, necessarily exempt from catching the coronavirus and perhaps dying? No, they're not. This virus is an equal opportunity virus. And just being a Christian doesn't mean that you are necessarily exempt. Christians may die in this situation. That's very possible. Our churches may be somewhat depopulated by this disease. Could happen. It's the world in which we live. It's a world under God's wrath and curse. And we're trusting him that whether we live or die, whether we remain or whether we go to be with him, he has us in his care. And even though these Christians died, they did not die without hope. They did not die in despair. They died in faith. And so we too live in faith and we die in faith. And we will forever be with our master who loves us. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for how your word comforts and challenges and encourages us, how it helps us to see beyond the reactions of the moment and to see things with a clearer eye, with eyes of faith. Bless this to our hearts, and Lord, help us to be not just hearers of this word, but help us to be doers of your word to the glory of our Savior. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. For our closing hymn, we're going to turn now to uh, the Trinity hymnal, hymn number 386. Uh, this is also found in a slightly different version in the Psalter hymnal. If you have the Psalter hymnal and not the Trinity hymnal, um, let me point you to the specific page number.
uh, in the Trinity, in the Psalter hymnal, it's 207, and that doesn't have the refrain, so you'll have to add the refrain, but you probably know this hymn. So from the Trinity hymnal, hymn number 386, let's stand together as we sing. Receive now the Lord's blessing, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.